Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is James Monahan. I'm the dramaturg and literary manager at Oslo Rep, and we are here today to celebrate a very important milestone. 100 years ago this month, Agatha Christie published her first novel in the United States, The Mysterious Affair at Styles, which introduced the world to one of its most famous detectives in Hercule Poirot and launched a career that would lead to Dame Agatha Christie being one of the most read authors of all time. Joining me to discuss this incredible legacy is a living master and interpreter of her work, Mr. Ken Ludwig. Oslo Rep audiences will remember Mr. Ludwig from last season's acclaimed run of Murder on the Orient Express. But of course, Ken is also a Tony and Olivier award-winning playwright who has written 28 plays and musicals, including six shows on Broadway and seven in London's West End. His work has been performed in over 30 countries in more than 20 languages. His best known works include Lend Me a Tenor and Crazy for You, which ran for five years on Broadway and won both the Tony and Olivier Award for Best Musical. And his Broadway plays have starred actors like Alec Baldwin, Carol Burnett, Tony Shalhoub, Lynn Redgrave, Joan Collins, and Robert Goulet, just to name a few. And his latest book entitled How to Teach Your Children Shakespeare was named Best Shakespeare Book of the Year. He's received numerous awards, including perhaps most relevant to our conversation today, the Edgar Award for Best Mystery of the Year, as well as the Edwin Forrest Award for Services to the American Theater. When the performing arts world is operating, as we all hope that it will soon, his plays are performed somewhere in the United States every night of the year, and we are so pleased that he is able to join us. Ken, thanks for sharing a bit of your time, and welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that nice introduction, and and uh, it's thrilling to be with you again after sure. last time I saw you, it was in the flesh and it was in Florida. Yeah, it, it seems both just like yesterday and forever ago. <laughs> so uh, where are you calling us from? I live in Washington, D.C., where I am right now in the place I study where I do all my work. Uh, and um, I haven't left it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's about mid-March. Yeah, yeah. How have you been holding up on all of this with, with theater shut down? Have you been able to stay active in writing? I have, I have. My, my life, I guess, has been sort of, well, threefold. One is with family and, and, and trying to make sure everybody's fed and watered. Uh, number two is um, uh, writing, you know, all the time. It's what I normally do. My nor In a way, I feel sort of guilty because my normal day and, uh, and week and month is um, writing plays in a chair and thinking uh, about structure and comedy and uh, all those things. Um, so I've been able to carry on pretty much sort of as normal, but it starts to, as you well know, grind away on you when you can't really leave the house and go out to dinner afterwards, unless it happens to be a place that's outdoor. Uh, and uh, so that so while I'm, I'm getting more work done than ever because I'm just <laughs> really facing that page and I have two plays uh, about halfway through each. I usually don't do two plays at a time. It's usually one because I've had so much time. I've kind of had two on the boil uh, that I'm ex really excited about that I will be sending to you guys as soon as <laughs> the minute they're finished. To see uh -huh. what like to do. I hope. Fantastic. So. No, uh, I, I look forward to reading. Uh, I always look forward to when you send us stuff. Oh, thank you. Well, as you know, and let me put here before I tell you, the, well, let me say the third thing I'm doing just generally is when people call and they want to do, and I spend an hour uh, there at a homeschooling convention about my book, How to Teach Your Children Shakespeare, because that is really great for, and everybody's homeschooling now, so it's not just people who normally homeschool. Or um, I did a um, uh, discussion of Jane Austen, uh, for societies, and I do podcasts, and a lot of that, and, and, and appearances like that have been taking up a good deal of time too. But that's fun; it's great. I just get a, I get to get on a Zoom call and and uh, act like I know what I'm talking about, which I don't. <laughs> um, but I have to say, let me just interject that um, I was in down to the Oslo uh, Theater when Murder on the Orient Express was on. Uh, just uh, nine months ago, maybe, mm -hmm. and uh, and I had the best time, and fell in love with your theater to such an extent 
I, I'm, I'm ready to fling myself and, and, and uh, on the theater and grab onto anything I can hold on and say, don't let me out of here. I want to stay here. So I really just love working at the theater. And it's just a great place and so well run. So anyway. Well, thank you so much for saying so. And we had a great time. Loved having you down here. Look forward to having you back. Uh, so I, that's a, a mutual respect there. And we'll look forward to it when, when things get back to normal, as we hope they will very soon. Yeah, I hope. Yeah. Um, but so speaking of Agatha Christie and, and Murder on the Orient Express and this incredible legacy that she's created, uh, you know, I think it's totally fitting that in the same month that we celebrate Halloween, that we have this anniversary of this thrilling mystery writer that comes to us. Do you remember when you first encountered Agatha Christie's work? Well, I think I don't remember a specific moment uh, of opening the book and going, oh my gosh, this is great, which I do with P.G. Woodhouse. But the source is the same, which was my mother. My mother, mm -hmm. I, I, my most recent play is called Dear Jack, Dear Louise, which is about how my mother and father met during World War II. So I've been thinking a lot about my mom lately. Uh, and um, she was a great reader and her favorite things were mysteries. She was a real mystery buff. Uh, <laughs> and it was nice of you to mention the Edgar Award because really, Unfortunately, she had passed away by the time I wanted it a couple of years ago, and and that would be the one thing she'd have really been so happy about. She'd have gotten such a kick out of it. Uh -huh. She used to say, "Oh, here's a here's my favorite book, the this Edgar Award winner." That and 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 uh, uh, she just loved mystery. So uh, early on, I was exposed to uh, uh, Dorothy Sayers and Ruth Rendell and and tons of great mystery writers, and then first and foremost, Agatha Christie. And so it was in that period when I was 10, 11, 12, that I was first exposed to, to Christie. And, and who doesn't just lap them up because they're so wonderful and fun to read. Yeah, they're, they're very hard to put down. You know, it's one of those, one of my first experiences with it was just page turn, page turns. One of those first novels yeah. in my early days as well that I just, I couldn't let go of. Um, and just... Coming, coming back to, to the Edgar Award for just a second, if, if I have the timeline right here, it was after receiving the Edgar Award that the Agatha Christie estate approached you about working on a stage adaptation. Is that right? That's, that's exactly right. Uh, um, uh, out of the blue, it was my agent who got the call, and then he just referred right to me. And the, uh, the Christie estate called and said, listen, we haven't had an adaptation of a Christie for the stage in about 30 years. What happened was during her lifetime, she, after writing a, a lot of her major novels, turned to the stage and started writing some uh, uh, works directly for the stage. And that included The Mousetrap, <laughs> the longest running show in history. Um, uh, and that was based on one of her short stories. Another one, Witness for the Prosecution. These were the three big mm. ones that were on the West End. Witness for the Prosecution. Uh, and the third one was uh, Ten Little Indians, uh, also known as And Then There Were None. Uh, uh, and um, that, I think, was based on maybe a novel, or maybe she turned it into a novel afterwards. But I think that it, that does exist in, no, in novel form. Uh, um, but then uh, she wrote a couple more after that that w weren't as successful. Um, and... And then you, you could see Agatha Christie's over the years because they gave the franchise rights to a very nice, produ good, very good producer, did some of my work in London, who, who toured her work around England throughout the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. But there were no new work. There were no new adaptations. They didn't allow any to go out. And they didn't. Uh, and after she passed away, there was no one, nobody who picked up the mantle. So when, when they called me, they said, look, we haven't had a, a, a new stage adaptation of Agatha Christie in decades and decades. And we'd like you to do one very flat, extremely flattered, as you can imagine. Uh, and you can pick whatever novel you want. Wow. Which was really interesting. Uh, so I thought about it a little bit, a, a little for a little while, a, and then it became pretty clear to me that I should pick Murder on the Orient Express because it's really, in a way, her best known title. Mm. It, it's, it's, it was just, a, it, it's a terrific title in itself. You know, titles are really important in the theater. Getting a good title to a play is really important. 
Mm -hmm. uh, a mystery that won the Edgar was called The Games of Foot. Pretty oh, good title. Not doesn't blow you away, but a good title. Oh, uh, good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> murder on the Orient Express is just out of this world because it's got the word murder in it. Orient Express is exotic. It gives you a sense of the piece, and, and it lived up to its promise because the the the, the, the uh, novel's terrific. So I, I said, "How about that?" They said, "Yes," and I started working on it and, and wrote it, and they were pleased. And here I, here we are. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know what kind of conversations went on at the Christie Estate, but based on seeing the run here at at Oslo, there's a, a uncanny kind of kinship in in your voice and her voice. The, they're they're different, but the way that they weave in and out of each other is really you know quite thrilling on stage and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm wondering um is there something in her work that 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 draws you through that that gets you excited when you think about interacting with it and adapting it there there is uh and maybe this is why they they chose me is um you know mysteries and com I'm most known for writing comedies and it's what I tend to write and think about. It's, it's, it's the kind of theater I love and I love classical comedies, not just the Shakespeare comedies, but She Stoops to Conquer by Goldsmith and the great Sheridan comedies, The Rivals and School for Scandal and then right up through Oscar Wilde and, and uh, um, uh, into Noel Coward. Um, uh, and comedy and mystery have a great kinship that a lot of people don't recognize at first glance. And, and this is my own theory, but it's this, that um, um, you start in a way before the first page or before the curtain goes up usually uh, with some kind of society that is working all right and it's, and it's okay and it takes care of itself. And it's in Agatha Christie's case, sometimes it's a village with the Miss Marple uh, story or it's uh, uh, um, a group of people getting on a train and heading off on a beautiful train. Uh, and, but then when you enter the story, something's wrong. And, and like a, as happens with comedies, uh, think of a jigsaw puzzle. Um, uh, the, 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 everything has been thrown up in the air and you can't make sense of it or it's all over a table and it doesn't quite uh, 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 things don't add up and it's hard to fit the pieces together to get the sense of, 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 of uh, finality. But somehow mm. over the course of that two hours on stage or the course of the book, the pieces start falling together again and locking into place, giving you a sense of reassurance and normalcy and, and peace and confidence. And that's what comedies do, and that's what mysteries do in spades. That's what mysteries are all about. And, and, and I think there was, a, in a sense, in my mind, and thinking about adapting an Agatha Christie play was, foremost in my thought was how to get that sense of there was a, there was a, was a normalcy that's now disturbed and something's wrong and we can't and figure it out, figure it out, and by the end getting a sense of uh, of conf co our confidence back. Mm. Uh, and that's what I think mysteries do. And that's what I think, exactly what I think comedies do, at least the kinds of comedies that I think about all the time and write, which I call classical comedies, whatever you want to call them, but ones that ha have a good, oh, the, a, a, str a strong sense of structure. Uh, and that indeed is also what you need for a mystery. No. Yeah, no, I, that makes a ton of sense. Uh, you know, we always talk about that, um, you know, comedy is in the timing or is in the math. And I think that's certainly true of mysteries as well, right? Seeing how we get from A to B and then we, have, you know, maybe missing a letter. How do we get to the end of the alphabet? Right. Right. Uh, that's where the fun comes in. That's where the mystery comes in. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's something about it, whether it's the, the structure and, or the satisfying conclusions or the thrill of the journey that has made Agatha Christie, even a hundred years on, one of the most read authors of, of all time. Is there something about her or is it just the mystery that, that continues to resonate so widely across cultures and across languages? Um, why do we keep coming back to Agatha Christie, do you think? Well, I think one reason uh, that may sound a little surprising, it, it, uh, but um, 
I think is an undervalued uh, a quality in very successful authors, which is when they are very prolific, they tend to be much more popular. Agatha Christie mm -hmm. wrote in 60, 70 novels of, of mystery. Yeah. Uh, I think of P.G. Woodhouse. I think of, of a lot of my just my favorite authors that I love the most. There are uh, Shakespeare was tremendously prolific. He lived to be 52 years old. He retired about, about six years before that. Uh, in that 20 year period, he packed in 38 plays. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he was tremendously pro prolific. So people who loved his work could keep going back to see it. There are obviously exceptions. Jane Austen, she mm. wrote six novels, and that's it. That's all we have. And she's and her extraordinary abilities are, are what win the day. Uh, well, with Agatha Christie, you've got both, you know, an extraordinary mind, a, 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 an amazing sense of plot, and being able to get what they used to call apparently in her day when she was writing was you get a Christie at Christmas. They were always timed, the publications were timed for sort of October. So that could be the Christmas book you bought. It was great. But she was writing a book a year consistently for 40 some 50 years. It's, and that's an extraordinary thing. As a writer, I look at, I've written about this point, maybe at 28, I'm, I think with the two new ones I'm working on, or about 30, 31. And I'm working flat out as hard as I can seven days a week, it takes a lot of um, uh, uh, energy, just raw energy to be prolific. And you start getting into a groove and you start finding out what you're really good at. And it's not that there aren't wonderful authors who don't do that, obviously, but, but she was able to really create a body of work so you could look forward to the next one and get used to Hercule Poirot or Tommy and Tuppence or Miss Marple, whoever she created, so you look forward to the next one. And the, the, the other thing that, that I find amazing about her that I think contributes to her longevity uh, or and our love of her is that I'm actually one of the plays I'm working on right now is a, a mystery and, and um, it's a, a comedy mystery, but her mysteries often have a lot of comic aspects to them also. I think it, so. It, is, um, is she's writing books, you have to have a lot of characters and you have to be very specific about those characters. You can't just have a lot of characters you introduce, say at the beginning of a play, you say, oh, well, who did it? Who's the suspect? You know, in a novel particularly, and then you have to translate that into a play, you know, who is that person? what motive might they have? How do you carry that onto page 30? And then again, when they reappear appear in page 60, what's consistent about them? And then in a book like Murder on the Orient Express, say the, for example, the novel has 12 suspects. There's quite a bit made about in it. Oh my goodness, it's like a jury of 12. That was one of the hints. Well, I couldn't do that in the play. It's too many characters. <laughs> I cut it down to eight. Uh, but you know she's she she generally has a a wide group of potential of suspects who are characters who you get you've got to know each one enough to consider them a suspect wonder what's going on so to juggle that big canvas is, is a real gift is tough and she was really good at it. Yeah, I mean, you pulled on two threads right there, just both in her master plotting of works and her uh, specificity of character. I, I find right. that many authors will have one or the other uh, or be stronger in one than the other, but she seems to be able to keep both of those things sort of neck and neck uh, yeah. in, in our minds, which is a, a huge feat, especially with so many characters, as, as you point out. Yeah. Um, so I wanna bring, this legacy that we've been talking about up, up to the present a little bit. And one of the things that I really appreciated about your adaptation of Murder on the Orient Express was it really pulled at some themes that felt resonant to me and still do um, about injustice um, and, and, and Faro's struggle with um, the letter versus the spirit of the law. And I'm, I'm wondering if you find things when you read Christie that speak to our, our, the current moment that we live in, um, in, in our country in America or, or around the world. Are there themes that she was playing with while she was writing that still um, cut to the quick today? Yeah, I think, I, I think so. 
uh, and I think you hit on it when you use the word injustice. In, in all mysteries, if it's a murder mystery especially, and I, most are, you know, you, you feel a, those near the person, those who love the, the victim, from the victim, you know, feel a sense of injustice. Uh, there's something, and there's a sense of evil, and there's something mm. fighting against that is dark, and you need to all all band together to fight it, uh, which is what we're exactly what we're going through, and which is why I'm writing the play I'm writing now, and it's set at a time of great injustice. So it's it's set in the in the 20th century to, at a, 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 in the during World War II, and you sense that there there is there is an evil out there, and it's not of your own making. And it's unfair that you should have to face this at this time. It's upset all your, it's upset your life, the, the, the trajectory you thought was going to go so nicely. But of course, plans never work that way. <laughs> and, 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 and you have to band together to fight it in so many of her novels, certainly in, in uh, Orient Express, and, and have confidence in each other and grit your teeth and get to the end. And that's, what we're, that's exactly what we're going through. And then at the end, if it works out like most mysteries uh, uh, do in her, no in her novels, certainly virtually all of them, you, again, you get that sense of reassurance that life will go on with some, with, with some sense of normalcy. And we need both those things right now, banding together and the sense that we're gonna get back to a normal. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit counterintuitive, but it's all the more rewarding for that, right? That uh, such a turbulent setting and such a chaotic or even evil setting can land us in a place ultimately that feels safe or right. that feels like we, you know, it has hope inside of it. Right. right? Yeah, but yeah, that's just right. <laughs> well, Ken, um, I want to thank you for, for joining us. And if there's anything else that you'd like to add about, um, about Agatha Christie, or you want to give us any more hints about what you're working on? Uh, all of any of that is welcome. But I, I know I also want you to get back to work so we can read it at some point soon. Um, Thanks. But, Thanks. Yeah. Uh, well, I just about Agatha Christie. I was so lucky they decided to pick me to do it because it, it opened up a whole sort of new world for me. I hadn't thought oh, I'd written the one mystery that won that award, but but you know I hadn't thought of myself ever doing those. But com then I sort of started to realize that comedies and mysteries have so much in common, and it's it's been a lot. It's been a, a great new world to explore for me as a writer. Uh, tons of fun, and uh, and and dealing with the estate has been terrific. They're wonderful people. Interestingly, I'll add. Okay, I'll add one last anecdote, which is uh, people may not realize, no reason they should, is the Agatha Christie estate when I first got involved, was run by her grandson, mm. uh, uh, Matthew Pritchard, uh, and uh, a, a great gentleman, a wonderful man. If you watch that um, uh, uh, Murder on the Orient Express for film with Albert Finney, if you get the version that has the extras in it, one of them is, is a, a long discussion by Matthew Pritchard of how it came to be. He's a terrific guy. Uh, and so he came over and after I did the first draft, we read it together and he'd say, said, you know, I don't know that, I don't know that Hercule would say this on the page. And of course I listened and he knew Hercule Poirot better than anybody. He had grown up being taken by his grandmother, Agatha Christie, all over Europe uh, uh, to operas. He became a great uh, lover of operas and he's on the board of the Welsh National Opera and, and uh, all because he was so close to his grandmother. So he knew, you know, that was his closest friend in the world and and uh, uh, and vice versa and then now he is retired it's been taken over by his son James so Agatha Christie's great great grand a uh, uh, great grandson there, yeah. <laughs> in charge, who is the one I deal with now who's who's a dear and we have a couple of big big productions coming up of the play uh, that I can't talk about but I'm sure, excited sure. About. Uh, uh, and uh, so I'm in touch with them a lot and he's been he's been they've been terrific to deal with well, I, we're in the theater world, certainly glad that that match was made. And uh, we look forward to at the Oslo and I think, you know, across the industry of uh, what's going to come next of that ma match. Thanks, so uh, thanks again for making some time to talk to us, Ken. Best wishes for, for health and happiness to you and yours. And uh, I hope we get to be back together in this beautiful theater soon. I hope so. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. 
It's been great to see you again.